Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being for our Friday morning coffee. All you people at home are missing some donut holes. They've got great food down here today. Kami uh, Aarons is a St. Louis native who joined Foxfire in 2017. She is responsible for curating artifacts, developing exhibits, and managing educational programming alongside Foxfire's museum director. Kami has represented Foxfire on NPR's The Splendid Table and in articles for the New York Times and Garden and Guns magazines. We have somebody very famous with us today. She has a bachelor's in history and a master's in historical archaeology. She is currently editing a volume on the women of Foxfire and slated for publication in March of 2023. On weekends, you can find Cammie rock climbing or hiking with her husband and two golden retrievers. She also has a penchant for baking bread and desserts, which everyone in the Foxfire offices are happy to sample on a regular basis. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited to share a little bit more about Foxfire with y'all. Um, so, uh, oops, excuse me, not yet. As Barbara mentioned, I am from St. Louis and I've been at Foxfire for about four and a half years now. Um, and during that time, I have had a, an amazing opportunity to learn all kinds of different skills, which I'll be able to talk about today as we go through this presentation. Um, but again, I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have at the end of the presentation. Um, just by a show of hands, I know some of you are from, or have ho homes on Burton or Raven. Have any of you been to Foxfire before? Oh, well, that's wonderful. How many of you have been in the past like three years? Okay, well, great. So you all need to come back because we've made a lot of changes. When I started, I came on as part of a, a National Endowment for Humanities Challenge Grant, which um, enabled us to reinterpret the entire museum space. So the first tasks that I was assigned when I joined Foxfire was to start working on exhibit redevelopment. So we were able to clear out several old buildings redo the exhibits in there, and add a lot of interpretive signage. So I definitely encourage you all to come back, and if you didn't get one on your way in, please make sure to pick up a rack car. Um, they have a little coupon on the back for you to use on your next visit. So I'm just going to play this um, drone footage here really quick so you can see what the museum space looks like. Um, this is just a sampling of our museum space. We do have over um, 100 acres of property, but about eight of that is developed into the museum campus. So we have over 20 historic structures that have been reconstructed on site. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into that in the next few slides. Um, but this is one of our most iconic buildings. This is our grist mill. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of gravel and mulch paths that you can walk through. But it's only about a half mile walking trail through the museum campus. And we do have driving options available for those who need it. Um, so as you can see, it's a very, very beautiful place to be. It's tucked up on Black Rock Mountain. We actually share um, the same mountain with Black Rock Mountain State Park and have a connector trail that goes between the two. So it's very um, still remote and uh, gives you a really great experience up there on the mountain. So what is Foxfire, though? <laughs> you can get this question a lot. There is no good elevator pitch for Foxfire because we do so much and we have such a long history. But Foxfire was founded in 1966. So when I tell this to school children, their eyes get really big because they can't conceive of how long ago 1966 was. Um, but we know that it really wasn't that far back in the past. Um, but it started in a high school classroom, which is pretty unusual, right, for a museum to start in a high school. Um, there was a bunch of students who were terrorizing their new English teacher. They didn't want to read Shakespeare because, you know, not everybody is like me or maybe other literature fans out there. And they were just bored out of their minds. And so they were doing all of the things that you're not supposed to do in a classroom, like throwing things at the teacher, maybe starting a trash can fire. Um, so the teacher was about ready to pull out his hair. And so he was like, okay, we need to figure out something that's going to interest you, that's going to engage you. So he turned it back to the students. He said, what do you want to do? <laughs> I'm at my wits end. What do you want to learn about? So as a group, the class decided that they wanted to write a magazine. So the magazine was originally intended to be a literary publication because this was an English classroom. So they started collecting poetry, um, you know, creative writing pieces, even artwork 
but they also wanted to tell some stories. So they started talking to maybe their grandparents or great aunts and uncles, maybe an elderly neighbor, um, and they just started talking to them about childhood stories, what their life was like, or if they knew any good folk tales. And the more that they talked to them, they, the more they realized that these people had so much to offer. Because in the 1960s, these folks who were in their 80s or 90s had been born in the 1870s and 1880s. These were people who grew up and still lived in cabins that their great grandparents had built. Most of these people still did not have running water. Um, they still cooked over wood stoves. They still raised all of their own food, canned their food, processed their own animals. All of these pieces of Appalachian culture that these high schoolers had no idea existed. And so they started to collect those stories and put them into the magazine. And the magazine sold out in the first week, so they had to reprint it several times. And it just happened to coordinate with the Back to the Land movement that was happening in the 60s. So Foxfire, the magazine that was supposed to just be this little high school project, just exploded because it found a national audience. And so these students began this process of collecting what we call oral histories. So they were just interviewing people, but what they were doing was saving oral histories from a generation that was rapidly passing on. They were saving these pieces of a culture that was quickly disappearing. And so all of that went into the magazine. And then the magazine fed into the book series um, and then created the Foxfire Center, which is our museum today. So these are some of the high school students um, several years after the start of the program when it was very robust. And they, after they published the first book, the Foxfire book, they were able to um, save enough royalty money to purchase the property where the museum's at. So they um, bought this old apple orchard. Again, I, I mentioned it was about 100 acres on Black Rock Mountain. And they themselves, the students, decided that that land was going to be their legacy. They wanted to create a space where future students and the community could come together and share and learn and celebrate their culture. Um, so they really took initiative in creating this space. They started saving old buildings and disassembling those buildings and reconstructing them on site. And for a long time, those buildings served as classrooms. There was a music classroom, there was an environmental science classroom, um, and then eventually those, as I mentioned at the beginning, have become our museum today. So each building <coughs> serves as a different exhibit or artist studio space that you can visit. But in, you know, in addition to just collecting these stories and sharing these oral histories, they had a mission. You know, They weren't just doing the project to do the project. <coughs> They did want to save these pieces of history, but they didn't stop there. So we are not a museum in the sense that we focus on a fixed time in history. We approach history as a continuum. We approach culture as an important part of our story and who we are. And so they wanted to continue investigating their culture in order to share with the, the broader nation and even the world what Appalachia actually was. Um, because when most people think of Appalachia, especially outside of the region, they think of these stereotypes. So they think of maybe like Little Abner, they think of you know the moonshiner, maybe even you know poor white trash people, or they think of Deliverance. Um, so the students, you know, Deliverance was filmed in 1972. The program really kicked into its height in 1972. The first Foxfire book came out in 1972. So the students were really hyper aware of these representations in the broader media, and they wanted to use their platform to share the stories that told the real Appalachia. So they interviewed indigenous peoples. They interviewed black people in Appalachia. They told stories of slavery in the mountains. They told stories of um, land dispossession from the Cherokee all the way up to the people who lived in the town of Burton before it came the lake. So they wanted to share all of these different stories that made up Appalachia and to show people that there isn't just one narrative of what Appalachia is. So one of the ways that they did this, as I mentioned, was by interviewing people, but also through the skills and the materials that people created. And that's the things that they collected that went into the museum. So they 
looked at different what we call material culture styles that's you know kind of the museum term but looking at what people were making and how they were making it tracing back those ways of creating and how that shows um, exchange between different peoples so I love this picture on the left this is a picture of Beulah Perry this picture was taken when Beulah Perry who was a black woman who showed the students how to make a um, cotton hamper she went with the students to visit Aunt Airy who was another basket maker to learn how to make this um, rib style basket that came over from Europe so again looking at and sharing different ways of making things and this is Aunt Airy here um, on your guys' right and so the Foxfire books help perpetuate the culture and tell stories through these crafts so you can pick up a Foxfire book and you can learn step by step how to make a basket, but you're also going to get the history of it. You're also going to get the culture behind it. So they did a really amazing job. Again, high school students, blows my mind, um, did a really amazing job of not just saying, okay, here's the DIY version, but here's what it means and here's how you should do it and what you should think about while you're doing it, which is pretty cool. Um, I do want to share this little video real quick. Take that, just pop it off like that. So I know that video is a little hard to watch. It was filmed in 1970 or 1971, so it was early industry film, and it's obviously decayed over the years, but we've been able to digitize some of these films. But I wanted to share that just so you see, you know, we have the student in the background with the camera, somebody's there talking to the craftsman, and somebody is videotaping it. So it really gives us a sense of what the kids were doing when they went out to collect these oral histories. So they were really, they weren't just sitting and talking to people, they were there watching people make things, they were helping people make things. And that, again, enabled them to write these really great articles that um, really capture the culture and not just tell us how to do something, which is really cool. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the Foxfire book um, and the Foxfire magazine really caught on with the back to the land movement of the 60s and 70s and led to rapid growth um, for the organization. It also was a groundbreaking educational style. Um, nowadays, when you talk to teachers, things like place-based learning, community-based learning, um, experiential education, all of those are like buzzwords that are very common in the education field today. But at the time, it wasn't. I mean, this was pretty unique to give kids this much authority in the classroom. And so one piece of the program is that the students um, were requested to visit other schools to teach other students how to do Foxfire. So they had peer-to-peer -peer learning happening. Again, just another way for the students to take agency and authority in the classroom. Um, and to make a difference among their peers. So they went to places like Australia, um, Texas, Alaska. They worked with indigenous communities. They worked with inner city kids. They worked with other rural populations. So to think about what it would have been like for a kid in the 70s who probably hasn't left the county, um, has never been on a plane before, their family probably doesn't have a telephone, to be able to get to go to somewhere like Alaska or even Texas or Washington, D.C. Um, when we talk to the students who went through this, I mean, they, they share with us how big a deal it was for them to be able to have those opportunities because um, they just, they, they did not have those options before. Um, so it was really important and impactful on the kids and their um, learning after high school as well. So those opportunities that the students had to connect with other people outside their region um, encouraged them to pursue higher education, encouraged them to go out and get degrees when maybe you know, that wasn't an option for them previously. 
Um, you know, and then a lot of those students came back to our county um, and were able to establish businesses and give back to their community. So we see a lot of those people returning now. They want their kids to go through the Foxfire program. So Foxfire, because it started so long ago, we're really starting to see this long-term impact that it's having on our community. Um, so in the in the 70s, after the first book, and they were they started building the center. That's when they were really also able to bring in more staff members. So they expanded beyond just the teacher. They relocated from Raven Gap Nakuchi School, which is a private school um, at the time. It was private public, um, and then it privatized. So the school or the Foxfire program moved to the county high school. And once it reached the county high school, they created all of these other classes. So they had Foxfire 1, Foxfire 2, Foxfire Music, um, which actually started its own record label. And um, they had a Foxfire video productions class in the 1980s. So they had all of these different courses that were integrated right into the school system that students were either required to take or highly encouraged to take. Um, so it became this huge program by the 1980s. Um, and so since then, we've had, you know, continuous magazine publication every single year. So we're entering our 56th year of publication, which is pretty amazing, all student written. And then we have over 12 books in the Foxfire Anthology, so Foxfire 1 through 12. And then we have several um, what we call companion books. So we have a book on winemaking, um, a cookbook, and some other books that are um, really cool. These are some images from when they started building the museum. So as I mentioned, they reconstructed all of the buildings on site. There was nothing at this apple orchard. We get that question all the time. Were these buildings here? Was this a village? No, um, it, was, it was an empty apple orchard, um, but it was the perfect property for what they did with it. So they identified buildings in their community that were falling apart, um, that had been abandoned, families weren't taken care of, um, or maybe somebody wanted to donate it to them and they loaded them up on a truck after tagging every single log and took it to the museum and then they put it back together log by log and then they filled the gaps between the log with um, a clay mixture that we called chinking. Then they split by hand all of the shingles to go onto the buildings and then they put in the floors and then they brought up all of their artifacts and built porches and trails. Um, to create this amazing museum campus that we have today. Um, but as you can see, for obvious reasons, we can't exactly do this with students today. Um, maybe a major safety issue there, just having those kids hang out on that roof like that. Um, but we are in the process of building a miniature village. That's a little bit easier for younger people to handle building, but we're making a um, little children's village that'll have five half-scale buildings for kids to play in. So we've got one of those started and it's, it's already amazing. Um, and then some of the students got together and built um, structures that were based on historic designs out of you know, historic wood that was just kind of jumbled up. They couldn't put it back together. Um, and so they really pulled, <laughs> you know, pulled out these skills of like geometry and architecture to be able to design these buildings themselves. So like our chapel was not an original structure, but they modeled it after a building that was up in Waynesville. So, you know, they had to go in and make really detailed drawings and they had to come back and measure out the wood and hand notch the wood with an ax and then put it up together. So just amazing skills that these kids were getting at the time. Um, and then some of you might know that there was actually a movie in the 1980s called Foxfire. Um, this was based on a 1982 play by Hume Cronin and Susan Cooper. Susan Cooper is a um, really well-known uh, British playwright and uh, children's author, actually. And then Hume Cronin was a very famous uh, Broadway actor at the time. And Hume Cronin was married to Jessica Tandy, and Jessica Tandy originated the role of Blanche in A Streetcar Named Desire. She was a good friend of Tennessee Williams. Um, so he, Jessica Tandy and Hume were doing this production on love stories, just different, different ways that people show or talk about love. And she came across Aunt Airy's story, and Aunt Airy Carpenter, I have a slide on her in just a minute, but she was just this remarkable woman who just became like a grandmother figure to everybody in Foxfire. And we have a book on her, and I, I swear if you read it, you feel like she's in your heart. She's just a, a really kind, welcoming person. And Jessica felt the same way when she read 
Aunt Aerie's story. And so she was like, Hume, we should do something with this. And it didn't work into that production, but they decided to take it a step further. They decided to write a whole play about Aunt Aerie's story as it represented the Foxfire community. But of course, in true Foxfire style, the decision was left up to the kids. So um, there's this really great story from Susan Cooper about her and Hume flying down from New York, coming up to the Foxfire classroom, and just sitting with this like panel of Foxfire students. And they were totally vetted. <laughs> they just asked them all of these questions. They took it very seriously. And then they asked Susan and Hume to leave the room. And <laughs> they discussed it while they were outside the room. And um, they decided that they trusted Hume and Susan to write this play. Um, because it was really important to them that Aunt Aerie and the other people in their community were represented in the right way. And they, I think they did a wonderful job with it. This picture right here in the middle is um, from the article on Aunt Aerie in the first Foxfire book, which is the very first time that Foxfire students met Aunt Aerie. Um, so it's not to gross you guys out, but she's trying to make souse meat. And so she's trying to get this hog's eye out of the hog's head. And she's having this conversation with the Foxfire students while she's trying to do this. So it's really hysterical to read, but they did a really great job reproducing it in the um, Broadway play and then the movie that was made in 1987 by Hallmark, um, which also featured Hume and Jessica Tandy, but that gentleman all the way over there on the edge is John Denver. And um, they came and filmed some of it in Raven County. A lot of the Foxfire students were involved as extras. The Foxfire boys played in a scene with um, John Denver. And then Foxfire, actually, the kids at the time, it just coincided that they were uh, hosting an impromptu fundraiser for somebody in their community who needed money for an illness. And John Denver decided to just show up and play. <laughs> um, so they really... You know, they had a good heart when they came into the community to make this film. And um, you can still find it. It is out of print, but you can find a copy at, like, thrift stores and stuff like that. But it's a really sweet movie that I recommend watching. But this is this is Aunt Airy. Um, and for those of you who know anything about Foxfire, you know that we talk about her a lot. And she was formally interviewed over, like, 20 times, I think. But... The students would just go to her house and like work in her garden or they would come over for um, you know Sunday dinner or they would come and they would take her to church or they would take her to visit a friend or sometimes they'd even just like stay overnight at her house. Um, so they had really, really close relationships with um, this woman and she was an amazing storyteller. Um, she had all these just remarkable stories because she was born in the 1880s, but she had a really difficult life as well. Um, but she just had so much love to give and she didn't really have any hatred and she welcomed everyone that came through her door. Um, they had some students visiting from New York and as soon as they left, she said, you guys come back anytime. Like I just met you, but you come back anytime. The latch, screen, the latch string will always be down for you. Um, so it just didn't matter who you were. She just like immediately took you in. And um, this is, you know, just a really nice quote from her. And as I said, we have a book just called Aunt Airy. Um, that's kind of a story of her life, but it's a collection of all the interviews that they did with her. And then this is just another um, individual that I want to highlight. This is Kenny Runyon. And Kenny was a really interesting <laughs> individual. Um, he was definitely kind of a loner. Um, he was a mountain man. <laughs> um, and he knew everything about the mountains. He could, I mean, the students would go out with him for like three hours and they would just walk through the mountains and he would point out every single plant that they passed and he would tell them what every single plant was used for, who used it, how they used it, why they used it, when they stopped using it. Um, he, he could identify anything. Um, and he claims that he studied with a Cherokee medicine man, and that's how he came to know so much. The other thing that Kenny really knew a lot about was um, like riddles of bulk tales. So he, every time the students visited that him, he gave them a new riddle to go home and try and figure out. And I would say they, they might have uh, not aged so well. They're a little bit difficult to figure out, but um, they are fun to read about, that's for sure. And then he was a master woodcarver as well, so he would make a lot of toys. Um, he used 
was really well known for making um, little door knock knockers that were like woodpeckers. But as you can see, he's got this really impressive like necklace on and he would make these and he would just like walk up and down um, Main Street and Clayton and sell some of these pieces of jewelry that he made, but they were all hand carved from laurel branches, mountain laurel branches. And then he did a similar technique with rhododendron branches that he would turn into these really elaborate, beautiful benches. And true to craft and form in um, Appalachia, Kenny passed on these traditions to a family member. So this is, you know, another key aspect of what makes Appalachian culture a little bit different or maybe something that wasn't seen in the 60s and other communities still is that this longevity, this intergenerational exchange um, between grandparents, uncles, and children. Um, and so he passed on his trade to his nephew, who again then became a Fox Bar contact later down the road. Um, but that's one of the things that the students were trying to participate in was you know, learning these crafts from an older person to be able to carry it on in the way that they did. Um, and so like Alex Stewart, who we showed earlier, um, as far as I'm aware, he didn't get to pass his craft on to anybody. And Alex Stewart was a master woodworker. Um, he was, in that video, he was working on making staves for a butter churn. Um, but what's remarkable about Alex's craft is, and we have some of his pieces in the museum, he didn't use any glue, he didn't use any nails. Um, he, his, his measuring tool, was two little sticks about this long, like uh, tied together with a little piece of leather. And that's how he would measure things because it would open and close kind of like a compass. Um, but that was it, you know? So he had such an amazing knowledge set in his, in his head, but he didn't write it down, um, you know, beyond what the students did. And so unfortunately, that's what the students were witnessing in the 80s and 90s especially was these crafts dying out because the people who were the knowledge carriers were dying out as well. Um, so they were able to help, you know, make connections or learn or preserve some of that knowledge. So what do we do today? We still have the Foxfire program. Um, it's not the same as it used to be because education's changed, students have changed, um, you know, what we can do as an organization has changed. Um, all makes sense, but we still have a program for students. So instead of working with one school, we actually work with all the schools in the county. So that opens us up to a little bit more diversity, allows us to offer more opportunities to students. So we are about to um, start our student leadership program, which is a six week summer intensive for 12 high school students. So they come to the museum, they get to work there, it's a job, which is awesome. Um, so they work there for like 20, 25 hours a week and they do um, a small group project. They are required to do a heritage skill, so they have to apprentice with one of our demonstrators and learn how to do spinning or blacksmithing or wood stove cooking. Um, and I say that in quotes because that's their favorite part. And then they have to help produce the magazine. So we still have two magazine publications every year. So that's kind of the educational component that we still work with. We do offer training to um, other groups who want to learn more about doing Foxfire-like programs. Um, but our main focus is operating the museum and our outreach programming. So our museum, as I said, all of these buildings that the students relocated to Foxfire have been converted into exhibit spaces or studio spaces. So we have, I don't know, maybe five to 10 demonstrators who come on a regular basis. We have a resident weaver and a resident fiber artist who share a studio space. And then we have a woodworker and a blacksmith who also have studio spaces. And then our other demonstrators just use different areas in the museum. Um, so we are able to offer those experiences to people to come and see how these crafts are practiced today. Um, but we can also offer classes, which is you know an important part of what we do is to continue sharing those skills, continue to build up those um, and preserve those, those knowledge bases that we have um, from the past. So like tomorrow I'm teaching wood stove cooking. Um, we do that regularly. We have somebody who te teaches flint napping once a month. Um, we have somebody who teaches felting, somebody again who teaches intro to woodworking and spoon carving. Um, 
so all of these different classes that people can come and learn and they're open to anybody and then um, we have special events where you can kind of come and get a sampling of everything that we have to offer we have a lot of community programming because we are a community-born organization so it's important for us to stay connected to our community so um, a few weekends back we had a what we call a community dye day where you can come and bring something to put into an indigo dye pot so you get to see a, a way of using natural um, materials to dye your clothing, which is pretty cool, especially for kids to experience. Um, we'll be having a blacksmithing hammer in where we have a gathering of blacksmiths come and everybody shows their different way of blacksmithing. Um, so we do programming like that and then we do lectures at our library, all these things just to keep people connected, not only to Foxfire, but to each other. And that's really important to us in our community. Um, and then, again, we love having young people. So we have a lot of tour groups that come through. We get a lot of kids, um, scout troops, um, anything to get them those hands-on opportunities because we all know <laughs> how important that is in this digital age for kids to have something tactile to do, to engage with, to engage with older people, to engage with people their own age. Um, so it's really wonderful to see those experiences. And the museum is open seven days a week for self-guided tours. So you can come and go through the museum at your own pace. We have, as I mentioned, a hiking trail as well that connects us to Black Rock Mountain State Park. So you can really have a full experience at Foxfire. But we also have, um, so these are, sorry, these, real quick, these are some of the events that I listed that are coming up. These are all on our website, which is on the rack card that you received, foxfire.org. Um, you can just go to foxfire.org slash events to see everything that's coming up. But as you can see, we've got a lot of really great um, options coming up here in the summer. And then down here at the very bottom, this is the last thing I want to talk about because um, I neglected to talk about it earlier, but um, we do a lot of digital outreach too. And this was before COVID and then obviously during COVID, it really picked up. But um, digital outreach has become an important way for us to connect with our audience because Foxfire is globally known. Um, and so we wanted to find a way to reach out to these people across America and in other countries and so we've um, created a digital membership where you can engage with Foxfire, um, especially back issues of the Foxfire magazine or receive a digital Foxfire magazine. But we're very active on our blog, um, which has just different featured stories from the Foxfire archives. But this is, um, you know, one of my favorite little projects is our podcast. And a podcast, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, is just kind of an audio program that you can listen to. And this is the perfect option for us because we have over 2,700 oral histories in our archive. And we are, since we're a community-based organization, a community-based archive, we are a closed archive. So you can't just come to Foxfire on your visit and go into our archive. Um, you have to have uh, approved research. But the podcast is a way for us to be able to curate those interviews and share them with the public. And it's such a, an amazing experience to listen to the voices of the people from Foxfire. So you can read about them in the book, which is great and all, but to be able to hear the way they speak, their intonations, their little phrases, um, it really just impacts you in a completely different way. Um, and so the podcast each month features a different topic um, that often pulls historic audio, which means that it's not always the greatest quality, but I try to pick ones that you can actually hear. And then we also include new interviews as well, again, showing that this culture is continuous, right? It's not just stuck in the past. And so being able to tie historic practices to the present is also really important. Um, and this is available for free on our website. Again, foxfire.org. Um, you can just scroll through the menu and you'll find our podcast page. But um, again, it's just a really great way to share little stories from the Foxfire archive because we do have so much there. Um, and I will just leave it there for now and hope that we have a, a really nice discussion. Um, so I'll open it up to questions if anybody has anything they'd like to know more about. Yes, Ms. Barbara. I've always wanted to see Fox Fowl. Have you ever seen it? I have not. Explain what it is, please. Yes, I will. So the question is about Foxfire itself. And this is something I did skip over, so thank you for bringing it up. 
But the magazine Boxfire is named after um, a folk name for a bioluminescent fungus. So it's a glow-in-the-dark mushroom um, that you can find in the mountains during the summer. So supposedly it grows on rotting wood in warm, damp locations. But you have to know where it's at because to find it at night, you have to go out without a flashlight, right? Because you can't see something glowing in the dark. You've got a light. But I have never seen it, um, and I would really like to. I know there's a lot up in the mountains, but the folk story behind how it got its name, at least the only one that I'm aware of, is that there was a fox chasing a rabbit through the woods, and he caught the rabbit, and he stayed up all night cooking it over this glowing <laughs> fire, and um, eventually the fox fell asleep, and so the rabbit got away, but that's why it's called fox fire. So. Great, any other questions? Is the uh, Foxfire Band, is it uh, connected with any way with the Foxfire Museum? Yes. So the Foxfire Boys um, are a band that play locally, especially up in Raven County. Very talented band. And they originally were the Foxfire String Band. Um, I think they had a girl in there for a while. And that was a band that was formed in the Foxfire Music class. So um, they started, I guess, in the 80s playing in their classroom, and then they went to, um, they were the ones who played with John Denver in the movie, and then they went to the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville and performed, and they are still together, and Tom Nixon actually um, runs a music store, Blue Ridge Music, in Clayton, Georgia, but yeah, they're a great band. Hello. Hi. Could you expand a little bit more on how it came about that Hume Cronin and Jessica Tent and the play mm -hmm. and the movie came about. How did, it was a miraculous kind of thing. Yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll share as much as I know. So the most that I know about how it came on Hume and Jessica's radar is again, Jessica and Hume were working on this like monologue production. I think it was an off-Broadway show um, where they were each taking different monologue pieces um, the, the theme was love, so they were looking at like not just um, you know marital love, but you know like uh, friendly love, love of things, love of places. And I guess Jessica had read the first Foxfire book just in her own time, and in the first Foxfire book is this first visit with Aunt, oops, sorry, with Aunt Airy, um, and. In that story, Aunt Ari talks about her husband, Ulysses, who had passed on by the time that the Foxfire students met her, and, um, and also her love of the mountains. So uh, Aunt Ari, like most people who are interviewed, have this deep, deep-rooted connection to the landscape of the mountains. Um, and so Jessica was really interested in the way that Aunt Ari was talking about that, and so she took it to Hume and asked if there was a way they could work it into that production as a monologue, and they couldn't quite get it to work out, um, but they decided, again, that there was a better option available, and that was to do a whole play on Aunt Erie. And so um, they reached out to Foxfire and got in touch with the students and went down and had that conversation, and the play was born, and then um, it was very popular. Jessica Tandy actually won a Tony for her performance um, in the Broadway production, and then um, it was picked up by Hallmark for a movie. And that's about as much as I know. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Um. You didn't specifically say this, but when the students started interviewing these people, uh, Appalachia as you call it, uh, were they all Raven County or were they a surrounding area? And how about now when the students are working, is it still just a Raven County oriented program? Sure, that is a great question. We are not limited to Raven County. Um, so we focus on a region that we call Southern Appalachia. There's a lot of different geographical and political definitions for Appalachia, but we focus mostly on Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and North Carolina. But the Foxfire students have interviewed people as far north as 
West Virginia and Virginia, and they've also gone down to Alabama um, in those mountain regions. So we look mostly at those states, and we continue to do that today, although I will say with the um, smaller size of students that we have, our reach is smaller, so we tend to focus more on Georgia and North Carolina, but we still are definitely not limited to Raven County. Um, but yeah, that's a great question, thank you. I'm interested in how you receive funding for Foxfire. I was very involved with it at its inset, and I, I know that we've supported through the um, Raven Gap Nakuchi Guild and Junior Guild in Atlanta, uh, the support of the school for scholarships for kids, and then Foxfire came along. So I'd like to know how you have built up your funding. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for your involvement with Foxfire. Um, so we have funding from a couple different sources. We are a registered nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we have a few endowments that um, you know, help support general operations. One of the endowments is specifically for our students, and so that endowment funds our student leadership program and the magazine production. Um, and that is also the fund where we offer four-year college scholarships to students who go through the Foxfire program. They apply and um, are selected, a few are selected to be recipients of a four-year scholarship. That also comes from the endowment. Um, we receive grants. We receive, um, you know, a few lo a local grant, a few local grants for like marketing um, sources, and then we generate some revenue from the museum. Um, a lot of our revenue still comes from book sales, so we re still receive all the royalties from our book sales. Um, and then, you know, donations. Donations are probably our biggest source of funding for general operations. Um, and that comes either from you know annual appeal or you know somebody comes to the museum and they had a great time or memberships things like that. So. Are there any more questions? Is somebody right here? Okay. Are there any of the original students still involved in the program? Yes, we, so I mentioned a flint knapper, which is someone who makes tools out of stone. He come and demonstrates probably on a weekly basis and teaches class with us. And he, I think was a student in 69 to the early seventies. So he's very involved, he's there all the time. And then we have um, several other students who stay connected for events. So they'll come and volunteer. Um, or, you know, like last year we had two high, of our high school students who were really interested in the origins of the program. So we had a lot of <clears throat> original students who were eager to share their stories with them. So they are still maybe not there in person, but still connected via phone or a letter. Um, they'll just stay in touch, which is great. It's great to hear their stories. Any other questions? Well, we want to thank you very much for coming. And also, I want to remind you. Great. Thank you that the East Library has, I think, all the Foxfire books over there. So the people in West just travel over to East and get, get one of those books. And we really do appreciate you very much, and thank you so much for thank coming. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate y'all.